three things last year. I told you that the statistics of the world has not been made properly available. Because of that, we still have the old mindset of developing in industrialized countries, which is wrong. And that animated graphics can make a difference. <laughs> Things are changing, and uh, today, on United Nations Statistics Division homepage, it says, by 1st of May, full access to the databases. <laughs> and if I could share the image with you on the screen, uh, so three things had happened, you know. UN opened their statistic databases, you know, and, and uh, we have a new version of the software up working as a beta on the net, uh, so you don't have to download it any longer. And let me just repeat what you saw last year. The bubbles of the countries. Here you have the fertility rate, the number of children per woman, and there you have the length of life in years. This is 1950. Those were the industrialized countries. Those were developing countries. At that time, there was a we and them. There was a huge difference in the world. But then it changed, and it, it went on quite well. And this is what happens. Huh? You can see how China is the red big bubble. The blue there is India. And they go over all this when I try to be a little more serious this year and showing you how. <laughs> how things really changed. And it's Africa which stands out as the problem down here, doesn't it? Large families still, and the HIV epidemic brought down the countries like this. This is more or less on what we saw last year, and this is how it will go on into the future. And I will talk on, is this possible? Because you see now, I presented statistics that doesn't exist. Because this is where we are. Will it be possible that this will happen? Hmm? I cover my lifetime here, you know. I expect to live 100 years. Eh? And, and this is where we are today. Now, uh, could we look here at, instead, the economic situation in the world? And I would like to show that against child uh, survival. We'll swap the axis. Here you have uh, child mortality. That is survival, four kids dying there, 200 dying there. And this is GDP per capita on this axis. And this was 2007. And if I go back in time, I've added some historical statistics. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Here we, not so much statistics 100 years ago. Some countries still had statistics. We are looking down in the archive. And when we are down into 1820, there is only Austria and Sweden that can produce numbers. Eh? <laughs> but they were down here. They had $1,000 per person per year, and they lost one-fifth of their kids before the first birthday. Eh? So this is what happens in the world. If we play the entire world, how they got slowly richer and richer, and they add statistics. Isn't it beautiful when they get statistics? You see the importance of that? <laughs> and here, children don't live longer. The last century, 1870, was bad for the kids in Europe, because most of the statistics is Europe. It was only by the turn of the century that more than 90% of the children survived the first year. This is India coming up with the first data from India, and this is the United States moving away here, earning more money, and we will soon see China coming up in the very far end corner here, and it moves up with Mao Zedong, getting health, not getting so rich. There he died, then Deng Xiaoping brings money, it moves this way over here, and the bubbles keeps moving up there, and this is what the world looks like today. Let us have a look at the United States. We have a function here, I can tell the world, stay where you are. And I take the United States, we still want to see the background, I put them up like this, and now we go backwards, and we can see that the United States go to the right of the mainstream. They are on the money side all the time. <laughs> huh? And down in 1915, the United States was a neighbor of India, present contemporary India. And that means the United States was richer, but lost more kids than India is doing today, proportionally. Huh? And look here, comparing to the Philippines of today. The Philippines of today has almost the same economy as the United States during the First World War. But we have to bring United States forwards 
quite a while to find the same health of the United States as we have in the Philippines. About 1957 here, the health of the United States is the same as the Philippines. And this is the drama of this world, which many call globalized, is that Asia, Arabic countries, Latin America are much more ahead in being healthy, educated, having human resources than they are economically. There's a discrepancy in what's happening today in the emerging economies. There, now social uh, benefits, social progress is going ahead of economical progress. And 1957, United States had the same economy as Chile has today. And how long do we have to bring United States to get the same health as Chile has today? I think we have to go there. We have 2001 United, or 2002 United States had the same health in Chile. Chile is catching up, catching up. Within some years, Chile may have better child survival than United States. Uh, this is really a change that you have this lag of more or less 30, 40 years difference on how the health. And behind the health is the educational level, and there's a lot of infrastructure things, and, and general human resources are there. Now, we can, we can take away this, and, and I would like to show you the, the rate of speed, the rate of, uh, of change, how fast they've gone. And we go back to 1920, eh? and I want to look at Japan, and I want to look at Sweden and the United States, and I'm going to stage a race here between this sort of yellowish Ford here, and the red Toyota down there, and the brownish Volvo. Eh? <laughs> And here we go, here we go. The Toyota has a very bad start down here, you can see, you know, and, and United States Ford is going off road then, and the Volvo is doing quite fine. This is the war, the Toyota got off track, and now Toyota is coming on the healthier side of Sweden. Can you see that? And they are back, taking over Sweden then, and are now healthier than Sweden. That's about why I sold the Volvo and bought the Toyota. And, <laughs> And uh, now we can see that the rate of change was enormous in Japan. They really catched up. And this change is gradual. We have to look over generations to understand it. And let me show you uh, my own sort of family history. Eh? We've made these graphs here. And this is the same thing, money down there and health, you know. And this is my family. This is Sweden, 1830, when my great-great-grandma was born. Eh? Sweden was like Sierra Leone today. And this is when great-grandma was born, 1863. Eh? And Sweden was like Mozambique. And this is when my grandma was born, 1891. She took care of me as a child. So I'm not talking about statistics now. Now it's oral history in my family. That's when I believe statistics, when it's grandma verified statistics, you know. <laughs> I, think, I think it's the best way of verifying historical statistics. Sweden was like Ghana. It's interesting to see the enormous diversity within sub-Saharan Africa. I told you last year, I'll tell you again. My mother was born in Egypt, and I, who am I? I'm the Mexican in the family. Eh? <laughs> and my daughter, she was born in Chile, and the granddaughter was born in Singapore, now the healthiest country on this earth. It bypassed Sweden about two to three years ago with better child survival. Eh? But they're very small, you know, they're so close to the hospital, we can never beat them out in these forests. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's what, but homage to Singapore. Singapore are the, the, are the best ones, you know? Now, this looks also like a very good story, huh? but it's not, it's not really that easy that it's all good story. Because I have to uh, show you one of the other facilities. We, we can also make uh, the color here represent the variable. And what have I chosen here? Carbon dioxide emission, metric ton per capita. Huh? This is 1962, and the United States was emitting 16 ton per person, and China was emitting 0.6 and India was emitting 0.32 ton per capita. Eh? And uh, what happens when we moved on? Well, you see the nice story of getting richer and getting healthier, and everyone did it at the cost of emission of carbon dioxide. There is no one who has done it so far. And we don't have the, all the updated data any longer because this is really hot data today. Eh? And there we are, 2001. And in the discussion I attended, with global leaders, you know. Many say, now, now the problem is that the emerging economy, they are getting out too much carbon dioxide. The Minister of the Environment of India said, well, you are the one who caused the problem. 
The OECD countries, the high-income countries, they were the ones who caused the climate change. Eh? But we forgive you because you didn't know it. But from now on, we count per capita. From now on, we count per capita. And everyone is responsible for the capita emission. And this really shows you we have not seen good economic and health progress anywhere in the world without uh, destroying the climate. And this is really what has to be changed. I've been criticized of showing a too positive <coughs> image of the world, but, but um, I don't think it's like this. The world is quite a messy place. This we can call Dollar Street. Everyone lives on this street here. What they earn here, what the number they live on is how much they earn per day. This family earns about one dollar per day. We drive up the street here, we find a family here which earns about two to three dollar a day. And we earn, drive away here, we find the first garden in the street, and they earn 10 to 50 dollars a day. And how do they live? If we look at the bed here, we can see that they sleep on a rug on the floor. This is what poverty line is. 80% of the family income is just to cover the energy need, the food for the day. This is two to five dollars, you have a bed, and here it's a much nicer bedroom, you can see. I lectured this for IKEA and they wanted to see the sofa immediately here. <laughs> and, and this is the sofa, how it will emerge from there. And the interesting thing, when you go around here in the photo panorama, you see the family still sitting on the floor there. And although there is a sofa, if you watch in the kitchen, you can see that the great difference for women does not come between one to ten dollar. It comes beyond here, when you really can get good working condition in, in uh, the family. And if you really want to see the difference, you look at the toilet over here. This can change. This can change. These are all pictures and images from Africa, and it can become much better. We can get out of poverty. My own research has not been in ITU or anything like this. I spent 20 years in interviews with African farmers, which was on the verge of famine. And this is the result of the farmers' needs researchers. The nice thing here is that you can't see who are the researchers on this picture. That's when research functions in poor societies. You must really live with the people. When you are in poverty, it's everything is about survival. It's about having food. And these two young farmers, they are girls now, because the parents are dead in HIV and AIDS. They discuss with the trained agronomist. This is one of the best agronomists in Malawi, Jonathan Mikombira. Eh? And he's discussing about what sort of cassava they would plant, the best converter of sunshine to food that man has found. And they are very, very eagerly interested to get advice. That's to survive in poverty. That's one context. Getting out of poverty, the women told us one thing, get us technology. We hate this mortal to stand hours and hours. Get us a mill so that we can mill our flowers, then we will be able to pay for the rest ourselves. Technology will bring you out of, 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 of poverty, but there's a need for a market to get away from poverty. And this woman is very happy now bringing her products to the market, but she's very thankful for the public investments in schooling so she can count and won't be cheated when she reaches the market. She wants her kid to be healthy so she can go to the market and doesn't have to stay home. Huh? And she wants the infrastructure that's nice with a paved road. Huh? That's also good with credits. Microcredits gave her the, the bicycle, you know, and information will tell her when to go to market with which products. You know. you can do this. I find my, my experience from 20 years of Africa is that the seemingly impossible is possible. Africa has not done bad. In 50 years, they've gone from pre-medieval situation to a very decent 100 year ago Europe with a functioning national state. I would say that Sub-Saharan Africa have done best in the world during the last 50 years because we don't consider where they came from. It's this stupid concept of developing countries which put us Argentina and Mozambique together 50 years ago and said that Mozambique did worse. We have to know a little more about the world. I have a neighbor who knows 200 types of wine. He knows everything. He knows the name of the grape, the temperature, and everything. I only know two types of wine, <laughs> red and white. <laughs> but my neighbor only knows two types of countries, industrialized and developing, and I know 200. I know about the, the small data about the difference. You can do that. <laughs> but I have to get serious. And how do you get serious? You make a PowerPoint, you know? And you make bullets. <laughs> Homage to the office package, no? Uh, 
What is this? What is this? What am I telling? I'm telling you that there are many dimensions of development. Everyone wants your pet thing. If you're in the corporate sector, you love microcredits. You know. If you're fighting in non-governmental organization, you love equity between gender. Or if you're a teacher, you love UNESCO and so on. In global level, we just want our own thing. We need everything. All these things are important for development, especially when you just get out of poverty and you should go towards welfare. Now, what we need to think about is what is a goal for development and what are the means for development. Let me first grade what are the most important means. Economic growth, to me, as a public health professor, is the most important thing for, uh, for development because it explains 80% of survival. Huh? Governance. To have a government that functions, that was brought California out of the misery in 1850. It was the government which made law function finally. Eh? Education, human resources are important. Health is also important, but not that much as a mean. Eh? Environment is important. Human right is also important, but it just gets one cross. Now, what about goals? Where are we going toward? We're not interested in money. Money is not a goal. It's the best mean, but I give it zero as a goal. Eh? Governance, well, it's fun to vote and a little thing, but it's not so much. You know? it's not a go and go to school, I mean, it's not a goal, you know? it's a mean. You know? Health, I give two points. I mean, it's nice to be healthy. At my age, especially, you can stand here, you're healthy. That's good. It gives two plus. Environment is very, very crucial. There's nothing for the grandkid if you don't save it. But where are the important goals? It's, of course, it's human rights. Human rights is the goal, but it's not that strong of a mean for achieving development. And culture. Culture is the most important thing, I would say. Eh? Because that's what brings joy to life. That's the value of living. So the seemingly impossible is possible. Even African countries can achieve this. And I've, I've, I've shown you the shot that the seemingly impossible is possible. And, and, and remember, please remember my main message. That is this, the seemingly impossible is possible. We can have a good world. I showed you the shots, I proved it in the PowerPoint, and I think I will convince you also by <laughs> culture. <laughs>